hand. Hey, how about, can we, can we just give the hand? I don't want to, I don't, I don't want the team to think we're giving them praise or nothing, but I'm so thankful that we have a team that even when our worship leader, Pastor Jordan, is on vacation enjoying some family time, we have a great anointed team that can lead us in worship, that can lead us into the presence of God. So I just want to give a shout out to, to Sarah and the team this morning for, um, for using their gifts and their talents for, for his glory and, uh, and, and allowing them to, to usher us into the presence of God. Amen. Go ahead and open up your Bibles this morning to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Hey, have you guys been enjoying the weather this weekend? How about this weather? Come on. I don't know. Uh, I hope you took advantage of the beautiful weather yesterday and got out and started raking your leaves or putting your Christmas lights up um, because it's going to get cold. I heard there's supposed to come snow on Friday. And somebody was telling me at one point they were talking about 30 inches of snow. But no, I think that's, that's now been changed to like two inches of snow. Praise the Lord. But uh, my wife and I were out yesterday uh, raking all of the leaves and doing some, some you know, trimming of the bushes and the, the trees and all that stuff. So um, I hope you guys have enjoyed the weather, though. Today's, I think, supposed to be beautiful as well. Does anyone know what the forecast is today? 67? Did I hear 67? Almost 70 degrees. It's like, it's like summer. All right. So that's awesome. So get out today after church and enjoy the weather. But it's, I've, I've been enjoying it. Enjoy it while it lasts because this weekend, this upcoming weekend, we might be getting some snow. So uh, enjoy it while it lasts. All right. Hey, a couple weeks ago, we started a new series called Not Just a Ghost. Go ahead and say with me, Not Just a Ghost. Not just a ghost. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. We are doing a study on the Holy Spirit. Not just a ghost, but the Holy Ghost. Amen? Not just a ghost, but the Holy Ghost. Over and over again, the Bible mentions the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Spirit of God is mentioned over 800 times in Scripture. Over 800 times the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, the Spirit of God is mentioned in the very second verse of our Bible. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God, everyone say Spirit of God, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now in the Old Testament times, the Spirit of God would actually descend upon people, and then it would often depart. We see this with with King Saul. It happened with King Saul. It would happen with with David. We see with King Saul, the Spirit of God would often be with him, and then it would leave him. It would come upon him, and then it would depart. With David, when David sinned against God with Bathsheba, when David sexually assaulted Bathsheba, he cried out to God in Psalm 51, verse 11. David said, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. So the Holy Spirit is not just a New Testament thing. The Holy Spirit was around at the beginning of time. The Holy Spirit was was hovering over the waters at the creation of the earth, before the earth was even formed. And then in the Old Testament, when when people would, um, like prophets would often play music, they would ask for a musician to come, and the musician would come and they would play so that the Holy Spirit would come and dwell in their presence. And then oftentimes the Holy Spirit would come and then it would depart. But in the New Testament, once Jesus left, Once Jesus ascended into heaven, he sent us his Holy Spirit. For those who are believers in Christ, the Holy Spirit will never leave us nor forsake us. He is with us. He is not just with us. He is in us. That is the difference between the New Testament and the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit does not just come and leave as he did in the Old Testament times. Now that Jesus went away and went to heaven, he sent us the Holy Spirit to be with us forever. And to not just be with us, but to be in us. Amen? In the New Testament, you can see the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus in the form of a dove at Jesus' water baptism. Which, by the way, if Jesus was water baptized, you should be water baptized. If the Son of God thought that water baptism was so important that even God in the flesh chose to be water baptized, how much more important is it for us to be water baptized? 
And we're having a water baptism service in just a few weeks here at Destiny. We've got invites so that for those of you who are being water baptized or want to be water baptized, we've got these invites that you can grab after service. Grab some of these, invite your friends and your family to come witness your, uh, your water baptism. Also, baby dedication, while I'm on the subject, baby dedication invites as well for those of you who are dedicating your children to the Lord. But if even Jesus himself was water baptized... I think you should be water baptized. And at Jesus' water baptism, it was such a powerful moment because when Jesus was water baptized, nowhere else in the history of the world have we ever seen the Trinity come to fruition like it did at the water baptism. When Jesus was water baptized, we see the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus in, in the form of a dove. And then you hear You literally heard, those who were witnessing Jesus be baptized, heard the voice of God call down and say, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So you had Jesus, you had the Holy Spirit, and you had God the Father, all three in one place at one time. Nowhere else has that ever happened, except for at his water baptism. Pretty significant, right? You can see the Holy Spirit falling on the people of God at Pentecost. We talked about this in part one in the form of fire. The people were in the upper room and they were praying and the Holy Spirit blew through the room and there were tongues of fire. There were little flames of fire hovering over people's heads. That's crazy. But that, was, that, that happened. That was real. That was the Holy Spirit empowering them to speak in other tongues and to do all sorts of miraculous signs and wonders. You see the Holy Spirit empowering people in the New Testament with spiritual gifts to live a supernatural life in a very natural world. We live in a natural world, right? But we need supernatural gifts. God has given each and every one of us supernatural gifts so that while we are living as Christ followers in the natural, we can live a supernatural life. Amen? The Holy Spirit produces the fruits of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who produces the fruits of the Spirit in a believer's life. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. These are the fruits that the Holy Spirit produces in our lives. Because of the Holy Spirit, we can have love when no one else has it. Because of the Holy Spirit, we can have joy when nobody else has it. Come on, we can have peace when no one else has it. Patience. Any dads in the place? We need some patience. Come on. Come on, dads. We need some patience. Kindness. Goodness. Gentleness. Faithfulness. And self-control. This is actually the evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit is actually the evidence that you've received the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives and that we are known by our fruit. Amen? We are known, a tree is known by its fruit. And the Bible says it's the Holy Spirit that produces this kind of fruit in our lives. So many people, though, are living a spiritless life when God wants you to live a spirit-filled and spirit-empowered life. I said God wants you as a believer, as one of his children, God wants you living a spirit-filled, spirit-empowered life. Got a couple people that are like, amen. I said God wants you living a spirit-filled, spirit-empowered life, church. Come on. God wants you living a spirit-filled, spirit-empowered life. Amen? John chapter 14. Let's read this together. John 14, verses 16 and 17. It says Jesus, so Jesus here is comforting his disciples as he's about to ascend into heaven. He's giving them some comfort because you got to imagine, remember the disciples, all they've known at this point is Jesus with them. And Jesus is about to leave and they're like, what are we going to do? We've been following you all this time. We've been seeing signs and wonders and miracles, and we've been spreading the gospel, but but what are we going to do when you leave us? And Jesus here, he's comforting them. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. Jesus had to leave him. Jesus had to go home to heaven. 
But he says there's another one that I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. All truth. The Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you and later will be in you. The Holy Spirit is with us and is now in us. Come on, somebody. Somebody say amen. The Holy Spirit is with us and is in us. Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as a him. Just, just, just want to throw that out there. God is not a woman, okay? The Bible, some of you are laughing, but there are, there, are, there are people who just ignore the fact that the Bible calls God Father. He is Father God, not Mother God. You can call Earth Mother Earth. If you want to call Earth Mother Earth, go for it. But God is Father. The Holy Spirit is a male. Jesus calls him Him. He is the third person of God in the Trinity. He is literally God in spirit form. Jesus says, I'm going away, but I will send you the Holy Spirit to be within you. And he calls him our advocate, our helper, and our counselor. Who is the Holy Spirit? Who is he? What does he do? These are some questions we're going to answer today. He is the one who intercedes and prays for you. He is also your counselor. The Holy Spirit is your advocate before God. He is your comforter. He is your helper. I'm so thankful we have the Holy Spirit to comfort us, to counsel us, to help us, to be our advocate, to go before us, before God, to pray for us. You know, the Holy Spirit actually prays for you. The Holy Spirit prays for you. That's awesome. When you look today, though, at Christians around the world, what you often see is believers. You see people who believe in Jesus, they love Jesus, they are saved, but they are unaware of the power that they have available to them through the power of the Holy Spirit. They are unaware of the power that is available to them through the Holy Spirit. They're not operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. They're not living that empowered life. They're not living that spirit-filled life. They're not living that victorious life that we have through the power of the Holy Spirit. They're still bound to the same sins as other people. They still struggle with the same bad habits as other people. Their prayer lives are flat. They're apathetic in praise and worship. They show no enthusiasm for the words that they're singing. When we sing praise and worship, this is not a performance. This is your time to read the words up on the screen and declare those words out loud to your heavenly father, giving him praise and glory and honor. And so many of us just stand there like we're supposed to give you a show. Worship is not a show. Praise and worship is not your time to come in here and just listen to a musical number. Praise and worship is the only part of the service that is not for you, it's for him. Every other part of the service is for you. But worship, don't miss worship. Don't come 20 minutes late and, and think, I can miss worship. I'll just make sure I get there for the word. The word's not for God. The word is for you. The one thing you can offer back to God in this service is your time of praise and worship and lifting up holy hands, as the Bible says, and give him the praise and give him the glory. It's not about you. It's about him. So don't think, don't think, oh, I'll just show up 20 minutes late. And I'm not trying to make anyone feel convicted, but if you're feeling convicted, that's the Holy Spirit, just saying. <laughs> I don't want anyone to feel judged or condemned. I'm just saying, don't take, don't miss, don't miss praise and worship, people, because the Holy Spirit is for him. You want the word? Awesome, that's for you. You want to give in our tithes and offerings? That's great. You know what? I know we're giving back to God, but you know who it's really for? It's for you to be blessed. It's so that your offering, it's so that your finances can be protected and so that it can be multiplied for his kingdom. So even when we give in our tithes and offerings, that's really an opportunity for you to be blessed. God doesn't need your money. He just asks for your faithfulness. He asks for your trust. And us in giving in our tithes and offerings is a tangible way for us to not just tell him that we trust him, but to show him that we trust him. That's why we give in our tithes and offerings. God don't need your money. He needs your heart. He needs your faith. And he needs your trust. 
And so many people can say, oh, I love God. I trust God. Do you really trust him? Can you give him first before you pay anything else? Can you give him what belongs to him first? That's where, that, that's where the rubber meets the road. If you really trust him, will you give him not your leftovers, not your leftovers. He doesn't want your leftovers. He says, give to me first, not because I need it, but because I want your heart. I want your faith. I want your trust. And he says, sh- he, he says trust me in this, test me in this, and I will prove to you, I will prove to you that I will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Come on. I've gotten way off track from my notes. Praise the Lord. This is just the inspiration of the Holy Spirit speaking through me this morning. Amen. Back to my notes. Here we go. But where was I? All right. When you look at Christians today, a lot of them are not operating under the power of the Holy Spirit. They show no enthusiasm in worship. And that's where I got off on my tangent. Don't miss worship. It's not about you, it's about him. But we see people who are afraid and struggling and gripped by fear and worry and anxiety. They believe in Jesus. They love Jesus. They are saved, yet their lives have no real power. Why? Why is that? God desires for his children to live a spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, spirit-led, spirit-equipped life of victory. The Holy Spirit empowers us to do what we cannot do on our own. The Holy Spirit allows for us to do what we can't do on our own strength. We need the Holy Spirit. But there's a lot of Christians who are trying to do life without him. They're trying to do life on their own. And they're not living the empowered life of the Holy Spirit. They're living instead a powerless, spiritless life. So let's get into it. Why are so many living a spiritless life? Why are so many Christians, Jesus lovers, Jesus followers, people who are saved and going to heaven, living a spiritless, powerless life here on earth? Number one, I want you to write these down. The first reason why some people are living a spiritless, powerless life is because they are simply unaware. They are not aware of the Holy Spirit. This might be some of you this morning, that until today or until we started the series on the Holy Spirit, you've heard of the Holy Spirit, but you don't know who he is and what he does. You don't really know the Holy Spirit. You're unaware. You say, I've heard of the Holy Spirit, but I don't really know who he is and what he does. We see an example of this actually in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 and verse 1. Let me read this to you. It says, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where Paul found several believers. Okay, so Paul's traveling. He gets to the coast of Ephesus, and he meets some believers, people who love Jesus, people who believe in Jesus, people who are saved and going to heaven, right? Right? And he asks them, Paul asks these believers, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they replied, no. We haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. <laughs> they were unaware. They said, no, we haven't, we, we, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. These were Christians who believed in Jesus, who loved Jesus, who were saved, but they were unaware. They were not aware of the Holy Spirit. And since they were not aware of the Holy Spirit, they were not operating under the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't operate in the power of the Holy Spirit if you are unaware of the Holy Spirit. They have no idea. They had no idea who the Holy Spirit even was. There might be some of you today in a similar place. You've heard about the Holy Spirit, but you don't really understand who he is or what he does. Let me just tell you, there is a whole other realm of power that is available to believers through the power of the Holy Spirit. There is a whole other realm of possibilities a whole other realm of power that is available to you. If you are a believer, how many of you believe in Jesus? Okay, as a believer, come on. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. And some of you are just simply unaware of it. You have it, you're just not aware of it. And because you're unaware of it, you can't operate in it. Christians all over the world are going through life without this power, without this supernatural strength. And on the other side, there is this spiritual power from God that is greater than you could ever imagine. 
Paul tells us in Ephesians that the very same power, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit lives in you. It lives in you. It's available to you. The same power that literally raised Christ from the dead, dead for three days, rose again, that power is available to you. That power is available to you. But many people are living in a spiritless, powerless life because they are unaware of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. Why are so many people living a spiritless life? Number two, write this down. Some people, a lot of people, are resisting the Holy Spirit. They resist him. They resist the Holy Spirit. If we're honest, this is a lot of us today. In fact, all of us have resisted the Holy Spirit at some point of our life. Every single one of us. Every single one of you. (laughs) Don't look at your neighbor. Look at yourself. Because every single one of us have resisted the Holy Spirit at some point in our life. The Holy Spirit has prompted you. If you're a believer, the Holy Spirit has led you to do something, and you said, nope, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do that. The Holy Spirit has poked you and prodded you and and spoke to you, and and you felt it. You felt it in your heart. You felt something in your heart saying, yeah, you need to do this. What would you do? You ignored it. You resisted it. You resisted the Holy Spirit. Tithe? I don't want to do that. Give God the first 10% that belongs to him. Show God that I don't only trust him, that I don't only love him, but I actually trust him with my finances. I don't want to do that. Resisting the Holy Spirit. Volunteer in the kids' ministry? (laughs) Teach kids, get thee behind me, Satan. That must be the devil talking to me right now. I don't want to serve in kids' ministry. I don't want to teach kids. We resist the leading of the Holy Spirit. Go on a missions trip? No, I can't afford to. I I can't afford to go on a missions trip. If God's called you to it, he'll equip you to do it. If God's calling you to go on a missions trip, he'll provide a way. But it it might involve you stepping out in faith and raising some funds and doing your part to do what he's called you to do. But these are some examples. These are just a few examples of the way that the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us and pokes us and prods us to do what he wants us to do, which is the will of God and the purpose of God, but oftentimes we resist him. We ignore him because our flesh doesn't want what the Spirit wants. You have to remember that. Your flesh does not want what your spirit wants. Your flesh is always going to be at odds with what your spirit wants. Your flesh will always be at odds with what God wants for you. Your flesh will never want to do what God wants you to do. Come on. Go to church. Your flesh doesn't want to go to church. Your flesh wants to stay in bed. But you all here this morning answered and were obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit to come here this morning. Even though your flesh would have rather you stayed in bed and watched online. If you're local, get your butts in church. If you're not, thank you for joining us online. I'm so glad that you tuned in today. But we got to get back in church, people. We got to get back in church. I was talking to somebody this week who was watching. They, you know, when we were all forced to go online, we, were, we all did it. When the lockdowns happened, we were forced to watch online. And he's like, it was great. You guys put on a great, you know, a, it was a great service. But I'll be honest with you, I wasn't singing in praise and worship. I'm not singing in front of my wife and my kids and in the living room. That's just weird. And I said, hey, let's be real. I, I, I hear you. I'm, I'm sure not a lot of people were just, you know, standing up by their couch with arms lifted high, praising and worshiping Jesus with their kids and their wife and, every, every, you know, there's distractions in the house. But what happens when we all come together in the house of God, in a house in, in an atmosphere of praise and worship, in a community with other believers? It's different. It's different. It's not the same. It's not the same. So some of us resist the Holy Spirit. Those of you watching online, maybe you resisted the leading of the Holy Spirit to be in church today. We miss you. We love you. Get back to church. 
Maybe you've been tempted. I mean, you're about to do something that is not right. And you know in your heart it's not right. And you feel something telling you, don't do it. Don't do it. Who is that? That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit prompting you to righteousness, convicting you of righteousness, saying, you know better. I know you want it. I know your flesh wants it. This is, again, where our flesh and our spirit are always at odds. Your flesh wants something, and your spirit knows what's better for you. And so you have to put your flesh under and obey the the leading of the Holy Spirit and push that away. But oftentimes, instead, what do we do? We push, the, we, we, we push the Holy Spirit away. We resist the Holy Spirit because I want it. I know it's not good. I know it's wrong, but I want it. And so we resist the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts you of sin or something that you need to change, and you ignore him. You've resisted the Holy Spirit for so long that your heart has become hardened to the gentle promptings of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit. Stephen in the New Testament, very young and courageous, bold believer. A man named Stephen in the, old, in the New Testament was, he was giving the Sanhedrin a little chewing out, the, the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin. And uh, he was chewing them out before they stoned him to death. He's like, you're going to kill me anyway, so I'm just going to tell you it like it is, right? He's like, I know you're about to stone me, so let me just give you a little chewing out in 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 the holy faith and in the presence of God. Let me just give you a little piece of my heart and my mind and my faith. And he says in Acts chapter 7 verse 51, he says, you stubborn people. They got rocks in their hands. They said, any last words? These are his last words. As they're about to stone him to death, they say, any last words, Stephen? And Stephen says, you stubborn people, you are heathen at heart, and you are deaf to the truth. You mu- you, must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Famous last words. It was after those words that they threw rocks at him and killed him. Stubborn people. You are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be heathen in my heart and deaf to the truth of God. I don't want to be deaf to the truth. Some of you may say, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure the Holy Spirit really prompts me or moves me or speaks to me. You know, it could be that you have resisted the Holy Spirit so often that your heart has become hardened to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because you've resisted him so much and you've ignored him so often, your heart has become hard. I've learned through failures to try my best not to resist when I feel like the Holy Spirit is prompting me personally. There have been times when I've resisted. There's been times when I failed, where I was not obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I've learned And you might ask, well, how do you know if it's the Holy Spirit prompting you or if it's just your own thoughts? How do you know if it's the Holy Spirit or if it's your flesh? How do you know if it's really the Holy Spirit that's leading you to do something or if it's all up in your head? Well, let me share with you a few ways. Because we are human and because humans are selfish in nature, here's a tip. If it's something that will only benefit you, If it's something that, when it comes to me, when I'm feeling like it might be prompted by the Holy Spirit, the way I test it between the Holy Spirit and my flesh, if it's something that will benefit me, I tend to think it's probably me, it's probably my thoughts, and it's probably my flesh that want it. If it's only going to benefit me, most likely it's not the Holy Spirit. More than likely, it's my flesh, it's my thoughts. But if it's something that doesn't necessarily benefit me, but it benefits others and might bring glory to God, then I just assume that that's got to be the Holy Spirit. I just assume it's the Holy Spirit. If it requires faith and trusting God, it's probably the Holy Spirit. If it requires faith, it's probably the Holy Spirit. If it requires you to put your trust in God, It's probably the Holy Spirit that's leading you to do whatever it is that's going to force you to trust and rely on God. If it's pulling you out of your comfort zone, if it's stretching you, it's probably the Holy Spirit. 
If I'm feeling convicted not to do something that I really know is wrong, in my heart, I know it's wrong. That's the Holy Spirit. If I'm feeling led to do something that's going to bless someone, I just assume that's the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing. If it's not the Holy Spirit, I just blessed somebody. (laughs) Not a big deal. If it wasn't the Holy Spirit, I just did something good for somebody anyways. Praise God. But best case scenario, if it was the Holy Spirit, then I just heard the Holy Spirit, I listened to the Holy Spirit, I obeyed, I'll be blessed for it, and then I'll be more sensitive to his leading next time because now I know his voice. Because I heard it, I listened, I obeyed, I did what he was leading me to do, and now I'll know his voice next time. And as the more you do this, the more clear his voice becomes in your life the more sensitive you become to the, to the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so if it's a blessing to others, I just tend to assume that's the Holy Spirit ministering to me to do something good for somebody else. You know, there's a pastor. There's a pastor I know that was sharing a story of a time he felt prompted by the Holy Spirit. And I want to read to you this letter. Pastor wrote this letter sharing about a time that he felt prompted by the Holy Spirit. He says, it was 11.45 p.m., PM, quarter to midnight, and I felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to call my friend at a very inconvenient time. I kept thinking to myself, it's 11.45 at night. It's almost midnight. I can't call him this late at night. That's crazy. I'll probably wake him up. You only call someone at that hour if it's an emergency, but As I kept trying to push it aside, the Holy Spirit kept poking me that I was supposed to call him. And so I called him. My friend picked up the phone and said, why are you calling me right now? I said, look, I'm I'm so sorry. I know it's super late, but I got to tell you, I just felt in my spirit like God wanted me to call you. My friend said, but why now? Why at this moment? And suddenly his voice started to break. And he began to cry. And he just said, why now? I can't believe you're calling me right now at this hour of the night. I'm sitting here with a loaded gun in my hand, thinking about taking my life. His friend said, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. His pastor friend said, my human nature, my flesh, did not want to make that call. My flesh was telling me, this is rude and inconsiderate. You can wait and call him in the morning. He'll still be there in the morning. He says, I'm so thankful that number one, I was aware of the Holy Spirit. I recognized his voice. And number two, I listened and I did not resist the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Because had I ignored the Holy Spirit's prompting, my friend would not have been there in the morning. I'm so glad that I did not resist the Holy Spirit. Wow. That's a true story. I know this pastor. And yet this is what far too many people do. The Holy Spirit leads you to not do something and you're all, but I want to do it. Holy Spirit's prompting you and speaking to you and leading you and guiding you. But your flesh, of course, doesn't want to do it. This is why it's so important that we strengthen our spirit man. This is why we come to church. This is why we read our Bibles, which is the word of God. And I believe it. It's got the power to transform your life. This is why we spend time in prayer and worship. We strengthen our spirit so that when the Holy Spirit prompts us to do something, we know his voice. His friend would have died. His friend was about to take his life. And it was the Holy Spirit that poked him at 1145 at night and saying, call your friend. And his flesh, of course, like many of us, would be like, are you you crazy? 
It's almost midnight. Who, who, who calls your friend at midnight? I'll wait until the morning. I'll call him. He'll, he'll be there in the morning. I'll call him tomorrow. He wouldn't have been. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. This is why it's so important that we know his voice, that we know his voice. We know and recognize the promptings of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit prompts you to do something. I don't want to do that. And you resist the Holy Spirit and your heart becomes hardened to his voice. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. The Holy Spirit will not push himself on you. If you resist him long enough, if you keep ignoring him long enough, he will leave you alone eventually. His voice will get quieter and quieter. Your heart might grow so hard that you don't recognize his voice anymore. Why are so many people today living a spiritless life? Some are simply not aware. They're just not aware. They don't know. They don't know the power they have available to them. While others are simply resisting. They are resisting the Holy Spirit. I want every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. The Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is in this place. And you have a choice to make. Every single one of you, with your eyes closed and your heads bowed, the Holy Spirit is here. And you can either surrender to him or you can resist him. But let me just warn you, the more you resist, the quieter his voice gets. The more you resist him, the harder it's going to be to follow his leading because your heart, you don't want it to grow hard to the gentle voice and his love and his leading of the spirit of God that would draw you to himself. God the Father loves you so much, he sent God the Son, Jesus, who would live a sinless life, die and rise again so that you could know him, be empowered by him through his Holy Spirit, to live a life that would honor and please and glorify God. Father, right now I ask you in your holy name, in the name of Jesus, I ask that your Holy Spirit would do a work that goes beyond any words of explanation that I have. God, thank you for your Holy Spirit, that he is present. We acknowledge him today. We ask him to do a work in our hearts that only he can do. We know that we cannot change somebody, that we cannot change people. But God, we recognize that the Holy Spirit can do a work in the hearts of people. So Holy Spirit, do a work in our hearts here this morning. Let us be so sensitive to your voice. As you're praying today, some of you are going to recognize right now that you're doing life pretty much apart from the Spirit of God. You may be a believer in Jesus, you love Jesus, you are saved, but you look at your life and you say, I don't see spiritual power. I don't see victory. I don't see all the fruits of the Spirit at work in my life. I believe, but I don't see it. I want a more Spirit-filled life. On the count of three, would you just lift up your hands? If you desire a more spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, spirit-driven, spirit-filled life. One, two, three. Lift up your hand if that's you. If you say, you know what, I recognize that I could be more sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. I recognize now the Holy Spirit is speaking to me, and I know that I need a more spirit-filled, spirit-empowered life. If you desire a spirit-empowered life, just lift up your hand right now. Thank you, Jesus, for all these hands that are up. Thank you, Father. I know there's more of you. I'm just going to wait a minute. The Holy Spirit is prompting you right now. You feel it. The Holy Spirit is poking you, and you're resisting. Don't resist. Don't resist. You have a choice to make. You can surrender, or you can resist. Don't resist. Lift up your hand right now if you desire 
for more of him in your life. If, 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 if I can have more of God, I want more of God. If there's, a, if, if there's more power available to me, I want that power. Lift up your hands. God, I thank you right now for, your spirit, for, for the spiritual hunger of this church. And I pray, God, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we would know your presence, God, that we would be aware of your guidance, that we would experience your promptings, God, that you are helping us and you are praying for us. I pray that we would not go through this life by our own power and struggling, God, but that we would know the supernatural power and presence of your Holy Spirit. We ask you right now, God, to fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us, empower us by your Spirit to do what we cannot do on our own. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. One more thing I want to pray for. If you're here today and if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I don't want anyone leaving without giving you the opportunity to invite Jesus to be Lord of your life, to accept the free gift of salvation. The Bible tells us that salvation comes by faith through grace. That it is by grace through our faith in Jesus that we are saved. It's not by works. It's not by anything you can do. You cannot earn your way to heaven. You can't earn salvation. It is a free gift paid for on the cross by Jesus. If you want to accept that free gift of salvation, if you want to put your faith and your trust in Jesus today, his grace is enough. His grace saves you. His grace is greater than any sin that you've ever committed. So if you want to surrender your life to Jesus right now, on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand. I want to pray with you. Maybe you're here today and you just want to make a recommitment. You just want to start over. You want to start fresh. You want to start new. I want to include you in this prayer as well. So whether this is your first time and you just recognize today, you feel the Holy Spirit prompting you to accept that free gift of salvation. Lift up your hand. Or if this is a recommitment and you just want to start over, lift up your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Lift up your hand right now if that's you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else today just want to start over? You just want to start fresh? You want to start new? Lift up your hand if that's you. Thank you, Jesus. You can put your hands down. I want to lead you all in this prayer. I want everybody in this room to just repeat this prayer after me. Don't just say these words, but mean it with all of your heart. Let's all say this together, especially those of you who lifted up your hands. Say, Father God, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins so that I could be saved. I thank you that he rose again so that I could receive new life in him. And today I choose to accept you as my Lord. I accept you as my Savior. Empower me by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We want to give you the opportunity to accept Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior. If you want to make that choice and have that assurance that you're saved and going to heaven, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to be the perfect and final sacrifice for all of my sins. Today I choose to live for you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me righteous. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you said that prayer for the first time, we'd love to send you a free gift all about your choice to follow Jesus. Simply email us at the link below with your email address. It's time now to give in our tithes and offerings. We want to thank you for your continued faithfulness in your giving. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10 that God provides seed to the sower. Keep sowing that seed and God will keep providing seed to sow. There are four ways that you can give. You can give online through our website. You can give through texting on your phone. You can give through our Destiny app and set it up to be automated. And you can give by mail. Thanks again for your generosity. We pray that God bless it and multiply it. In Jesus' name, amen.